Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Are, are there two civil wars? What am I looking for? I feel like there's something missing. Headphones? Well, you guys can't see this. That's, that's a thing. Hey guys, I uh, hope you're all doing well. My name's Connor. If you're new, original link to the video from Crash Course, top of the description. I used to watch this channel all the time a few years ago. Uh, prior to the channel. Let's go. 15-minute video, English Civil War, Crash Course, European History. Uh, let's learn. If you're not ready to learn, well, you can at least teach me because I'm going to have a lot of questions. A lot. So this is the, this is the, did you have two civil wars? This is the Cromwell, Charles the first time, royalist, parliamentarian, or let's go. This is Crash. Hi, I'm John Green, and this it, is Crash Course European History. So as we saw last week, absolutism was in the air during the 17th century, but not just in France. Across the English Channel, King James VI of Scotland became King James I of England after the death of the childless Elizabeth in 1603, and he found himself thinking, you know, I might not agree with those French Catholics about every... It looks like she's been dead. What happened? This is a crazy good painting, by the way. And he found himself thinking, you know, I might not agree with those French Catholics about everything, but they are on to something when it comes to the divine right of kings to have absolute <laughs> power. The inhabitants of the British Isles, however, weren't so sure. In fact, Protestant reformers were imagining a different idea of government. That's right, my friends. The constitutions are coming. I wonder if there are any, like, in, uh, British people today who, like, want to go back to this or like want to rip up the magna carta and just go to supreme ultimate monarchy again probably not So when he inherited the British throne, James aspired to unite his holdings in Wales, England, Scotland, and Ireland into a more cohesive whole. But of course, those regions, despite their geographic proximity, contain quite a lot of religious, ethnic, and economic diversity. Religiously, Calvinists, called Presbyterians in Scotland, Catholics, and Anglicans had... Ooh, I didn't know that. Religiously, Calvinists called Presbyterians in Scotland. So Calvinists and Presbyterians are the same thing? All of these different uh, Christianity dominate denominations are very confusing. Catholics and Anglicans had big disagreements. Also, if you've ever been to a Scottish bar and accidentally said how much you're enjoying your visit to England, you will know that Scottish people are not English. True story, by the way, the entire bar went quiet all at once. It was really uncomfortable. And then I tried to fill that silence by saying, well, you have the same money, which also didn't go over great. James thought he could solve these problems by taking the title of King of Great Britain, one place, one king. He also had his officials institute English laws across all his kingdoms and promote adherence to Anglicanism, and he sought to keep the peace among Europe's great families by marrying his son Charles to Henrietta Maria, the Catholic sister of Francis Louis III. Is Anglicanism um, a Protestant style? Or is it a Catholicism style just separate from the, the Pope? Does that make sense? But that only ended Henrietta Maria, the Catholic sister of Francis Louis XIII. But that only ended up furthering divisions because Henrietta Maria refused to convert to Anglicanism and became a target for opponents from various factions. Henrietta Maria's husband, James's son Charles, came to the throne in 1625, and he too firmly believed in the divine right of kings because, you know, of course he did. He was backed by the nobility and about half of the gentry, or the wealthy landowners 
members who were below the nobility, but other members of the gentry opposed the idea of absolutist monarchical power, as did many other less powerful people, including many farmers and much of the merchant classes who tended to live in cities. Those groups didn't have titles or ancient claims to land, but they were driving much of Britain's economy, and they felt that the elected English parliament should have more power, because of course that would also mean that they had more power. In 1628, Charles bound to that parliamentary strength by agreeing to the Petition of Right, which said that the king could not raise taxes without parliament's permission, but then he was like, I think I might have found a loophole, and he basically ghosted them. He simply stopped calling parliament back into session, which of course infuriated parliament, and also felt like a rather blatant absolutist move from a king who had just agreed to a check on his power. I feel like he must have been like, well, hey, th th this isn't against the rules we agreed upon. Okay, dude. Meanwhile, Puritans, who objected to the pomp of Anglicanism with its statues and stained glass and incense, resisted the Archbishop of Canterbury named William Laud, who was attempting to bring the Puritans back to Anglican Orthodoxy. Puritan critics were tortured, sometimes put into the stocks or whipped, some had their faces mutilated. Odd, who was attempting isn't the archbishop of canterbury the represent the representation of the pope but Anglic anglicans split with the pope because of that whole divorce stuff and now the Archbishop is also Anglican now? Orthodox? Orthodox Anglicanism. Attempting to bring the Puritans back to Archbishop of Canterbury named William Laud, who was attempting to bring the Puritans back to Anglican Orthodoxy. Puritan critics were tortured, sometimes put into the stocks or whipped, some had their faces mutilated, as were members of the upper classes who disapproved of the king and his administration. Then Laud stirred up defiance among the Presbyterians in Scotland whom he also aimed to restore to Anglicanism. He pushed them to adopt a new version of the prayer book of the Anglican Church, and resistance to that was literally riotous. Young women hurled the new prayer books during religious services and provoked their congregations to join them. In fact, the Presbyterian Scots were eventually so enraged that they invaded England. In response, after more than a decade of refusing to summon Parliament, Charles was like, oh, uh, Parliament, can you come back, please? I, I need your support in declaring war. Like many a ruler, Charles I thought that warfare, which he undertook on numerous occasions, would make Parliament rally around him and allow him to raise taxes. But that was a big mistake. Instead, the representatives responded by removing Archbishop Laud from power, decreeing that Parliament must meet at least every three years, and putting additional roadblocks in Charles's way. When Charles three called years. on soldiers to arrest the members of Parliament who had thwarted his demands, outright civil war erupted. Between 16 1642 and 1646, okay. those loyal to the king, called Cavaliers, faced off against those loyal to Parliament, called Roundheads, because of their short haircuts. Parliamentary forces raised the new model army led by Oliver Cromwell, and this new army saw opposing... How are there... Are, were the metal... Was the metal armor of the time really this well-fitting? Or was this just the artists making it look more well-fitting. Like, they almost look like they fit, like, T-shirts or suits. Religious it's impressive. Sect army led by Oliver Cromwell, and this new army saw opposing religious sects let go of their differences, which allowed them ultimately to capture Charles I and then execute him in 1649. We also have to remember that during these years, the Little Ice Age was taking its toll. Many people died from famine. Furthermore, between 1625 and 1630... This is much more similar to the similar sounding to the what happened during the french revolution it seems eerily similar and it's 150 years before the bubonic plague came back in the 1600s 
Wasn't that more of like a 1300s thing? Huh. Is the bubonic plague just like a catch-all term for what we call plagues back in this time? Or was it a specific illness that's called bubonic or obubos? Never mind. The bubonic plague killed some 45,000 people in London alone. Amid successive bad weather, entire villages disappeared as their inhabitants either died of illness or starvation or else abandoned their communities in search of food. And all of that enhanced the resistance and criticism of those who found it impossible to pay more taxes so that Charles could realize his absolutist dreams and fight his wars. A higher percentage of Britain's population died in this period than during both World War I and World War II combined. But with the war ended and Charles defeated, England was now... I'm sorry, what? ...is his absolutist dream. N not accounting for population inflation and growth? Even with the lower populations during the time, it's still more. ...and pay more taxes so that Charles could realize his absolutist dreams and fight his wars. A higher percentage of Britain's population died in this period than during both World War... Oh, a percentage. Higher percentage of Britain's population Sorry, died I'm in dumb. this period than during both World War I and World War II combined. But with the war ended and Charles defeated, England was now a republic, although not quite like contemporary republics since it was ruled by the King increasingly Cromwell? dictatorial Oliver Cromwell. Although come to think of it, that does make it like some contemporary republics. Cromwell was still the head of the New Model Army, but without a shared enemy in the king, all those varying sects and religious factions Actions went back to squabbling with each other until Cromwell wiped out those in the New Model Army who objected to the policies of his Puritan regime. Cromwell's army, for instance, crushed the Catholics in Ireland, whom it was suspected favored a restored monarchy. But even so, Cromwell could not keep his army or his government unified, despite building a very impressive network of spies. In 1658... Was that the time period uh, Cromwell's getting into Scotland where a lot of... Ulster, where a lot of English people were brought in to Northern Ireland to create the population of of English people in Northern Ireland that's there after today. Less five, despite building a very impressive network of spies. In 1658, after less than a decade in power, Cromwell died. And as civil war once more seemed inevitable, in 1660, Parliament summoned Charles II to the throne. Did the center of the world just open? Is there a wig in there? Am I going to have to put that on, Stan? So this was the time... It sounds just like the French Revolution. Just a little more warfare globally, or... Anyways, never mind. Okay. In English... Because they brought back the, the son of the one they killed, right? There. <laughs> Is there a wig in there? Am I going to have to put that on, Stan? So this was the time in English history when the Whigs that I at least associate with English history and fancy British people started to be a thing. What purpose did they serve? Well, then as now, they were a way of concealing hair loss, but also people like to cut their hair short to minimize the risk of lice. So now I'm worried that this wig that Stan gave me has lice, and we're going to move on with the video. So Charles II so was... So it has nothing to do with people just kind of looking the same in... in Parliament? Summoned by Parliament to become the English king. And you might be wondering why someone who'd seen his father ex- One of you said in a previous video that is his real hair. Parliament to become the English king. And you might be wondering why someone who'd seen his father executed for being King Charles I would want to become King Charles II. But humans are moths that fly toward the light of power, power. my friends. Yes. And Charles II I'd do thought it. he could be a better king. In some ways, he was. His reign began the so-called restoration, a time of creativity and discovery and also further tragedy in 1665 another outbreak of plague quickly killed some 30,000 people and then a fire the next year fire broke out in london destroying more than 10,000 so easy to remember the name of the london fire or remember the date because it's like 666 fire 1666 i was in buildings including many churches and businesses the monument to the great i heard fire a lot i'm london. pausing so much i'm sorry i'm not okay that a lot of the reason for that fire spreading might have been because of the overhang overhanging second floors, or I guess you would say first floors, 
And so it, it like the fire could transfer more easily. I don't know if that's a myth. It encapsulates just how thoroughly religious disagreements shaped every facet of human life. Even when memorializing the dead, the monuments inscribers couldn't help but make it sectarian, writing, here by permission of heaven, hell broke loose upon this Protestant city, the most dreadful burning of this city begun and carried on by treachery and malik of the Pope. Don't let a good- uh... Now, of course, that wasn't true. The fire started in a bakery run by an Anglican. Charles II, meanwhile, had a Catholic mother in Henrietta Maria and was seen to be gravitating toward what that monument called the Popish faction. He loosened restrictions on Catholics and other dissenters, a move Parliament responded to with the Test Act of 1673, which excluded all those who weren't loyal to the Anglican Church from government positions. So just for a quick recap, James I tried to unite all of Great Britain and Ireland under one absolutist crown, before dying in 1625. His son, Charles I, ended up being on the losing side of the English Civil War and was separated from his head in 1649, at which point Britain technically became a republic that more closely resembled a military dictatorship, which eventually failed, leading in 1660 to Charles II becoming king. Charles II had at least 12 children, but none with his wife, so his rightful heir was his brother James, a Catholic, who would eventually become king, but only for a few years. But before we get there, let's go to the thought bubble. Across these decades, people saw the social order turned upside down as some male reformer. How did they find out that the kids that he had were not with, were with it someone else? Couldn't he have just lied and been like, yo, nope, this is our kid. I'm sure the wife would just say like, no. But then I'm surprised there aren't more like killings of spouses speak just so like, oh, keep quiet. Nope, this is actually our son. He's the heir. Whereas proposed free love order turned upside down as some male reformers proposed free love and women took up arms, even carrying them openly during the 1640s and 1650s. <laughs> One pro parliament. That's why. <laughs> okay. That's why, because the wife would shoot you. A woman recalled seeing the leader of the Irish rebels approaching, writing that she, quote, sent him a shot in the head that made him bid the world good night. Other women began publishing and preaching, with Quaker women emphasizing the divine light shining from all humans, both male and female. And with the political scene fluctuating so rapidly and alliances changing, women served many roles, including as spies, even going to other countries to gather intelligence on those plotting to restore the monarchy, or when it was restored, those plotting to overthrow it again. Among these was Afra Bain, daughter of a butcher and midwife. She was pro Stuart, the family name of James and Charles, and traveled incognito to the Netherlands in the 1660s to gather intelligence on Stuart enemies. However, Bain also picked up another career, soon becoming a popular playwright at a time when, as part of the world turning upside down, women began going to the theater and serving as actresses. Before that, men had taken yeah. women's roles in plays. In 1688, the year before she died, Bain published Orinoco, the story of a wrongly enslaved African prince and his love for a highborn slave woman. In this regard, Bain was part of a thriving restoration literary scene, which rejected Puritan austerity in favor of wit, sexual desire, and playfulness. Thanks, Thought Bubble. So despite the efforts of Afra Bain and her ilk, the Stuart drive for absolutism halted for good in between 16 1688 and 1689, when the Catholic ways of James II just became too much for the pro-Parliament advocates, and when, to compound the danger, James's second wife gave birth to a son and heir. James's older daughter Mary and her spouse William III were summoned as monarchs to replace James II, but only after they agreed to rule by a Bill of Rights. This document stated in its first article that no monarch would reject or publish publish a decree without the consent of Parliament. It also guaranteed some of the rights later found in the U.S. Bill of Rights. It's like a Magna Carta II. 
rights, including, for instance, the right to bear arms, at least as long as you were Protestant. And it's important to note that political theory underpinned this political transformation, which came to be called the Glorious Revolution. And this is the part in European history where we usually talk about Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. Thomas Hobbes took a very pessimistic view of human nature and argued for an absolutist form of political organization in his book Leviathan. It argued that a lack of political regulation created lives that were, quote, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. In Hobbes's worldview, with absolute rule, one surrendered any claim to personal liberty, but received in exchange a measure of personal well-being and protection. Okay, I hate that argument. This is why I would never, like, uh, it's like, we get to do whatever you want. And you'll get all the programs you need. I'll take care of you, okay? And it just... Okay, but I'm, I'm taking that and giving up any power to change life. And who's even going to know if you're going to back up that promise? Like, that, that's, that's the most horrifying thing a government can say, is we'll take care of you. We'll do everything. Don't worry. Just live your life. We'll take care. Okay, but we're going to be an absolutist form of government. Nope. No, I. That trick. Um, that absolutist government. But there was another famous English theorist of government and human society, John Locke, who presented a much rosier view of humanity in his two treatises of government. Locke argued that in a natural world, individuals were born free and equal, but that they rationally banded together to create a government that would uphold laws and protect their rights. So of humanity in his two treatises of government. Locke argued that in a natural world, individuals were born free and equal, but that they rationally banded together to create a government that would uphold laws and protect their rights. So Locke is seen as articulating a theory of government similar to the one put forth by the Glorious Revolution, and also similar to the one outlined in the preamble to the U.S. Constitution. And in many ways, Locke's political thought is the foundation of traditional or classic Liberal. We the people in search of a more perfect union to protect, defend liberty, I forget. That is the belief in rights and freedom as intrinsic to the human self. And we see this theory amplified from Locke's time down to the present day. Like today, many of us take it for granted that humans have certain natural rights, including the rights to life, liberty, and property, language taken directly from two treatises. But human rights are an invented concept, albeit a very useful one. King Henry VIII, for instance, did not agree with the notion that those who claim to own land actually owned it, as evidenced by his extensive reclamation of Catholic land for himself. The creation of concepts of human rights reminds us again that how we imagine the world, and indeed how we imagine ourselves... I think it's helpful that when we look at figures in history and stuff they did, bad or good, okay? Especially the bad, because the good, I think, is easier to, to look at and see how every person can do it. But when it comes to figures and the bad stuff they did with because of the power they had, I think it is so important that we see that not as a person doing something, but what a person in power can do, you know? Because pointing out just a person and the bad things they do, I think lets our guard down in that like, oh, that was just a person. It's like, no, that's what people can do when given a lot of power, you know? bad things. Everyone is capable of good things. Everyone is capable of bad things. There have been very, very, very 0.0000001% of the population in history to have an enormous amount of power, okay? There are a lot of people in history, but compared to everyone, all right? And so you can't judge how the whole population um, or we can't, we don't know how every single person in society would act if given an amount of power. And so it's easy to see when someone in with a lot of power does something bad as if like that's specific to that person. 
where I think it needs to be seen as where we can only judge the people that have had the power. And I think the people who have done bad things, a lot of power are an example of what a lot of people, if they were given the power would do. I hope that makes sense. And each other deeply impacts the world in which we end up living. Whether we believe in human rights and how we act on that belief has profound consequences today, just as it did during the Glorious Revolution. Next week, we're going to cross back to the continent to see the Dutch variant on constitutional government, including like all its that. twists and turns and cannibalism. Oh, yeah. Thanks for watching. I'll see you. The, the, you guys like ate the prime minister or something. You then thanks for watching crash course uh, i love it uh john green is that his name i love the the host love the channel and uh that was very informative in fact w where was the recap to the king for instance peeled weather evasion or else a national roadblock funded by a ruler charles Presbyterian Scots were eventually so... Uh, thanks guys for watching. Love you all. Hopefully I'll see you guys next video. Would appreciate any comments. I'm just going to keep the video going for a little bit just to see if I can find that. I love that he did a sum up real quick. Erupted. Faced off against 1642 and 16... ...elementary strength by agreeing to the petition of right video. So Charles II was seen his father execute the light of... ...including with that monument but before we get there let's go to the thought bubble across these decades was the second thought he could be i forget exactly okay it was when he did the recap it's like so james the first uh wanted to unite the uh, you know british british isles into, into one thing he died his son came in um he tried to get more power he was executed cromwell came in kind of a dictator he died. They brought back the monarchy. That that very basic understanding is super important on subjects like this that I don't know very well, because it it makes me want to then get into the details. You know, when, when I'm confused about the grand picture of things, I really don't have the urge as much to really get into the details because it seems just overwhelming. It's why I love channels like History Matters, for example. A lot of people, when I watch those videos, are like, this is so simplistic, okay? Well, I, that's why I like it. It's, it's so that I can be introduced to topics that I don't know a lot about, would like to know more, just like the very basic general points about it, and then I can be like, oh, interesting, and then go further in, into the topic. So, love y'all. Hope y'all see you guys next video. Would appreciate any comments. Chin up if you're not doing well. You'll be good soon. Emotions are fickle, my friend. See you guys next time. Bye.